I'm going to be reading Jeremiah 32, 17. O Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. There is nothing too hard? Caleb ran. I told him, I said, I may grab you and ask you a question before you get off the stage, but he booked it like the flash to get off stage. <laughs> it's all right. Good job, son. There is nothing too hard for thee? That's what Jeremiah says. There is no, he says that in the, in the midst of a prayer. And if you read Old Testament prayers, they just don't sound like our prayers. They spoke to God in a different kind of way than we tend to speak to God. Ironically, they spoke more boldly to God than we do, though we're the ones who have the right to be bold, according to Hebrews 4. But they would speak to God like um, peasants approaching a king, needing relief. They would speak to God like wronged people appealing to a righteous judge and they would plead their case they would make their arguments and they would say things like how can you let this stand or how can you let this happen or don't you see these people and what they're doing and I'm here trying to do good and they're prospering and I'm not will you just smite them already and bless me and they would speak like that to the father in heaven we don't often do that so Jeremiah in the midst of one of his many lamenting prayers he makes that statement in the midst of him saying his request, he says, nothing is too hard for you. I know you can do this thing that I'm asking. Whether you will or will not is up to you and your will, but I know you can because nothing is too hard for you. But really, nothing is too hard for God? Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Is that too hard for God? Can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? That's the question on the screen behind me. That's one of those Famous, classic, it depends on your personality and your, um, I guess, approach to the Lord, whether you would call it a riddle or a paradox. You call it a riddle if you just think it's a fun little curious thing to consider for a minute. You'd call it a paradox if you were deliberately trying to undermine the idea of God. If you were trying to unravel the notion of the divine in someone who is a believer, trying to make a believer into a non-believer, you might try to question the nature of God and say you say God is all-powerful but can God in all of his power make a rock so big that he cannot lift it and if they say yes then you say aha so there's something he can't do he can't lift it he's not all-powerful And if they say no then they say aha so he can't do something he can't make that rock so he's not all-powerful it seems like it sounds like no matter what you say one way or the other they've got you in the horns of a dilemma Grabbed on both sides, unable to twist or turn. They've got you trapped, and they've got you starting to doubt God. So what's the deal? Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? I have one basic answer to it. I'm going to break into three parts. First of all, God is all-powerful. Your Bible makes that idea clear. God is omnipotent. We use that word. God is all-powerful. Jeremiah says, nothing is too hard for you. The idea of God's all-powerfulness, the idea of God's omnipotence, is however framed in the Bible and defined by believers within the sphere of that which is. All that can be, God can do. All that exists, God made. Anything that could be destroyed if I don't have the strength to destroy it anything that could be made but I don't have the ability to make it God can destroy and God can make but it is not blasphemous to say that God can't do something that God cannot do something and when you frame this question this way your answer is not too complicated it just sounds at first glance and they'll quick to jump on it and say ah but you're saying God can't do something I'll come back to that in a second First of all, God is all-powerful, but what that means is every rock that has been made has been made. Every rock that could be made has been made, and there is no rock he can't lift, or he would have made a rock that I can't lift that he could lift. God has made all the rocks that there are to make. He is all-powerful to make every rock. If you want to imagine some hypothetical, some other rock that exists beyond the sphere of existence, I don't care if God can lift that rock or not. Because as far as I'm concerned, He can lift all the rocks. Second, God is a spirit. He doesn't have fingers with which to lift a rock. The question is ludicrous on the face of it. But that's not really the point I want to make here. The point I want to make is God has made everything that has been made. All things are made by Him and there is not a thing that has been made that wasn't made by Him is basically what John says at the beginning of his Gospel account. What you're doing with this question is you're posing a paradox of words. 
not a paradox of ideas. If it was a paradox of ideas, then you've got someone questioning if God really exists or not. And there is no paradox of ideas that would unravel the trueness of the divine. This is a paradox of words. It's playing fast and loose with terms and definitions of terms to make something seem like a contradiction, but is not. It is the same as asking, could God make a married bachelor? No. No. And I'm not insulting God by saying that. And it doesn't undermine his existence by saying that because a married bachelor is a contradiction of words. If you're married, you're not a bachelor. If you're a bachelor, you're not married. It's asking for a four-sided triangle. Not a pyramid. That's a four-sided three-dimensional object. This is a two-dimensional object. A four-sided triangle does not exist because the definition of the word triangle implies three angles. You can't have four sides to a triangle. It doesn't exist. A rock that's so big God can't make it can't exist. It can't exist to be, made, to be lifted or not lifted, to be made or not made. You see what I'm saying? It's a contradiction of ideas, of words, not of ideas. But really the best way to answer this question, to put in the most simplest of terms, God is like Hulk Hogan. Now that's not blasphemy, that's a simile. He's like, it's a comparison using like or as. And the rock is not, not that rock, the rock in question in the paradox is Andre the Giant. And surely by now you know the reference. If those of you who are old enough, end of March 1987, WrestleMania 3, Pontiac Silverdome, the main event, world champion Hulk Hogan, having won the title from the Iron Sheik in January of 1984, had gone undefeated for several years in championship bouts, and now he stands toe-to-toe against Andre the Giant, this man who was billed as undefeated also in championship bouts. Hulk Hogan at that time was billed as standing six foot four. About 280 pounds, he was a giant of a man with giant pythons for arms. Hulk, Andre the Giant, his opponent, seven foot four, standing 500 pounds. And that shot, that famous shot of the main event of WrestleMania 3, where you see Hogan on this side of the screen and Andre the Giant on this side of the screen, and the, the giant Hogan is looking up at Andre, and then you hear Gorilla Monsoon's famous call. He says, with Jesse the Body Ventura to his right, he says, the irresistible force meeting the immovable object. And that's just a wonderful little turn of phrase. It's, it sounds like a Yogi Berra-ism. One of those little phrases that it, you get what he's saying, but it doesn't make sense the more you think about it. The irresistible force, meaning the immovable object. That's a common expression. We've heard that for years and years and years. It makes no sense. It's a stupid saying. If there really is a truly irresistible force, that is a force that moves and cannot be stopped, then there simply cannot be an immovable object for it to run into. If there is a truly immovable object which plants its feet and cannot be moved, then there cannot be an irresistible force because it would resist it. So the two things cannot coexist at the same time. Your Bible does not say there is a rock so big God cannot move it. Your Bible says God made everything. Put your faith in God, not in an imaginary rock. Because one exists and has shown his existence and has proven his existence through the things which he has done and the word which he has written and the miracles which he has performed. The imaginary rock is just an imaginary rock. Now, having said that, there are some things God cannot do. I am saying to you, based on your illogical, nonsensical, so-called hypothetical, paradoxical statement, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? No. No. Because no rock can exist. You started with, can God make? No, God can't make a thing which cannot be. He cannot make a married bachelor. He can't make a four-sided triangle. He can't make a rock so big he can't lift it. Because it's a paradox of words. And aha, aha, the critic will say, so you're saying God can't do something. Doesn't matter if it's ridiculous. You're saying God can't make a married bachelor. You're saying God can't make a four-sided triangle. You're saying God can't make that rock. Yeah, so what? There are things which God cannot do and me saying that is not blasphemy me saying that is not remarkable your bible says that multiple times it makes that clear and the bible often will say that in the three points i'm going to give you this morning as a way to provide hope for you not to cause you to wonder or doubt or question his ability but rather to recognize what he can't do and how it's good for you listen god can do anything you need him to do God can do anything he needs to do. Everything else is just gravy. But there are some things God cannot do. Let me share three of them with you, and then I'll be done. First of all, God cannot be tempted 
with evil. Open your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 13. James 1, 13, and look at what the New Testament proverb writer says. Let no man say when he is tempted, quote, I am tempted of God, end quote. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Do not say whenever you're tempted, God is doing this to me. God is tempting me to sin. God does not tempt you to sin. The devil does. God cannot even be tempted to sin. That's a quote from the inspired, from God himself inspiring James. God cannot be tempted with evil. Now let's make sure we define our terms properly here. Because my Bible, maybe yours too, sometimes muddies the waters of the word here and often conflates temptation with testing. For example, when Jesus is uh, in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. By the way, Jesus, who is God, is tempted because he's a man and you can tempt a man. And God is not a man in the spirit form. So Jesus, when he's in the wilderness to be tempted, Matthew 4, uh, among the many temptations that the devil offers him, Jesus responds with each one. Among them, Jesus says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. But that word is a poor translation. Tempt should not be there. It should be test. Do not put God to the test. That word means don't push God. Don't push the limits of God like a child testing his parents. Don't push to see how far you can push God. You don't have the right to do that. You could do that, but you shouldn't do that. You can't even tempt the Lord. Another way it's misused in another text is in Genesis 22 verse 1 which my Bible, Moses says, that God decided to tempt Abraham by telling him to offer Isaac on the altar at Mount Moriah. I'm going to preach a sermon about that next week, among other things. But that is not a good translation there. He doesn't tempt Abraham. The word means he put him to the test. He tested the faith of, of Abraham. So we, we, uh, we play fast and loose with words and we get confused sometimes. The word tempt, as in to draw someone toward a sin, to allure them and entice them, God cannot be tempted with evil, but you are. Keep reading in James 1. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished with you, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness in the shadow of turning. God gives you good things. It's the devil's fault when you're tempted with bad things. And the devil will make the bad things seem like a good thing, but it is a bad thing. Therefore, it doesn't come from God. Good things come from him. It comes from the devil. God cannot be tempted with evil. But you are, are you not? I am, all the time. But the thing of it is, is the things which tempt you may not necessarily tempt me. The devil is not omniscient. The devil is not omnipotent. The devil is not omnipresent. The devil is not God. But the devil is very old. The devil is very smart. The devil is very patient. The devil is very observant. And the devil is very cunning, determined, disciplined after you. He's looking for you. He's studying. He's learning. He's trying to get you. And so he will find what makes you tick. He will learn what butters your bread. He will figure out what draws you away from God. Every, every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lusts. It may not be mine, but it may be yours. And he'll entice you with it. And then we'll start a process, which in this very poetic verse uses a metaphor of life and death. It will, it will conceive. And then when it, has bring, when it has finished conception, it will bring forth not life, but death. You'll give birth to death because you'll have sinned and stained your soul. God cannot be tempted with evil. You can't tempt the Lord. You can't offer Him something bad because He is by nature good. Everything He does is automatically good. Bad has no appeal to Him. There's no challenge for Him. There's no test for Him. There's no choosing one door or the other for Him. God just always is automatically good. He just exudes righteousness. But you, you have to choose. And the devil's here to make sure you are given an option B to choose evil. So be mindful of that. God cannot lie. Something else God cannot do. God cannot lie. Now think about the difference between this one and the one we just finished. God cannot be tempted with evil. That means I am incapable of tempting the Lord. I can't, really, it's me, I can't do something. I can't tempt God. I can't draw him away with sin. The devil can't tempt God. But this one's all about God. God makes all kinds of promises to you. 
God makes all kinds of assurances to you. God makes all kinds of threats to you when you disobey. God makes all kinds of blessings that he tells you that you will receive one day. He does not lie. He will not lie. He cannot lie. That's a comfort. I know, therefore, that if he tells me at the end of that finish line, on the other side of that checkered flag, when you get there by your faithfulness, I have heaven waiting for you. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to worry. I don't have to doubt. I know because he is incapable of telling a lie. Open your Bibles to Titus 1-2 and see those exact words there, at least in my translation, hopefully yours too. Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised to them before the world began. You have before you, child of God, Christian, you have before you a checkered flag, a saving salvation moment at the end of all things. March toward it. Run toward it. Run uphill. Crawl sometimes. Pick yourself up and keep running. Get knocked down and get back up and keep going. Keep going. Keep going. It's worth it. Keep going. Why? Because God can't lie and he promised you heaven is waiting for you. God is incapable of it. Just to double down on that point, flip over a few pages to Hebrews and look at what the Hebrews writer says in chapter 6. Read with me 16 through 18. For men truly swear by greater things. An oath for confirmation is to them for the end of all strife. We're debating something, we're striving, so people would often tell an oath. They would, I swear on something, on something greater than themselves. And they would do that to kind of add some validity to the statement, to end the dispute, will you or won't you? Well, I'll take an oath. Okay, I'm not saying you should, but that's why people do it. Wherein God, on the same token, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Here's God, and he wants to show his people who by nature among themselves are dishonest, who are always breaking their promises, always stabbing each other in the back, always saying one thing and doing another. That's how people are. Shouldn't be, but that's what sin has done to us. We're all acting like that now. So God, recognizing that in the people to whom he's making his promises, wants to show us that there is a being out there who always keeps his word. So what does he do? He wants to show the immutability of his counsel, and he confirmed his promises by an oath. And that by those two immutable things, to those two unchanging things, those two things he won't break, his promise and the oath that's sealed to it, in which it is, what's your Bible say? Impossible. Not possible unfathomable, unthinkable, non-existable for God to lie. So we might have strong consolation, we who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. The hope set before us is our eternal destination. God has promised it to us, and God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. But you do, don't you? I do. We have all, if you're old enough, told a lie. And by old enough, I mean you're old enough to talk. Because just about then is when the child who still eats the cookies out of the cookie jar when they're not supposed to before they can talk, does it after they can talk, only now they get to say, I didn't do it. It's the same thing, except now they can put words to it, to the bad thing they did. So once you're old enough to talk, you're old enough to tell a lie. And we usually do, right about then. You do lie. Let's think about this. Why do we lie? Why do we tell lies? Why does somebody feel the need to say something that is not true? Think about that while we read this next verse. Look at James 5, verse 12. James 5, if you're in Hebrews, go to the next book. James 5, 12. But above, all, but above all things, my brethren, swear not. Now that doesn't mean say a bad word, though don't do that either, but it means uh, don't take oaths, okay? Don't take oaths, neither by heaven nor by earth. I swear to heaven, I swear on the earth. Neither by any other oath, but let your yeas be yeas, let your yes be yes, and let your nays be nay. In other words, if someone asks you and you say, yes, I will, just do it. You don't have to say, yes, I will, swear to God. You don't have to say, yes, I will, swear on my mother's grave. You don't have to say, no, I won't, I swear on my children's heads. Just don't take any oaths, just be an honest person. Why do we feel the need to take an oath? It's because people often lie. And because people lie so much, because I may lie so much, or you may lie so much, if I'm giving you a, my word, if I'm saying, yes, I'll do that, I may not be trustworthy. You may not want to trust me. So I may need to put a little collateral on that statement. So I'll say to you, I will do that, I swear to God. 
You should never do that. Don't blaspheme the Father and wrangle him into your dishonesty, to your unfaithfulness. Or I swear on my mother's grave, I never understood the idea. Okay, you tell me you'll be there at 6 o'clock tomorrow. You swear on your mother's grave. It's 6.05 the next day. You're not here. Do I own your mother's grave now? What does it even mean? It doesn't mean anything. That's the problem with an oath. It doesn't mean anything. It's just more words. But we say that, and we're, we're invoking emotion to try to sway someone mentally. This is what deceivers do. I'll say to you, I swear. But if you're a dishonest person, then you could be lying about swearing. So it doesn't matter. It's a waste of time, and it's blaspheming God, or it's disrespecting your parents, or anything else, because you don't own your mother's grave. You certainly don't own God. Heaven's not yours. So what are you swearing on? You only swear by things greater, and you're supposed to be humble. You can't swear by things greater. God made those things, not you. But why do we feel the need to do that? Because we lie. Why do we feel the need to lie? There's a few different reasons. Sometimes people lie just to make excuses for some bad thing that they did. You know, a little child, you come into the living room, the vase is broken, and the dog is sitting there wagging his tail, and the child is sitting there kind of doing this. You pretty much know which one broke the vase. It wasn't the dog. And the, but you ask the child, and the child will say, I was just sitting here, and the dog ran in and knocked over the vase, and the vase broke because the dog broke the vase. No, the child broke the vase because the child was running from the dog because he barked and he got scared and he took off running and broke the vase. But the child lied, blamed it on the dog because he didn't want to get a spanking. Spank the dog, I don't care, don't spank me. So the child wants to avoid repercussions to hide some wrongdoing that he's done. That's a common reason to lie. Some people lie to exaggerate their, their uh, sense of self. They, they feel insecure about who they are, their place in the world, so they lie. They puff themselves up. They exaggerate, say they are capable of things they're, that, that, that they're not. It's a common reason people lie. Some people do it because they're undependable, because they're, they're promise breakers. I said I'd be there tomorrow at 6 o'clock. At 6.15, I finally show up and I say, sorry, traffic was a nightmare. Traffic was not a nightmare. I just slept in. But I lie. Why? Because I need to make an excuse because I failed you. I let you down. Now tell me why God cannot lie. Because God's never broken a vase. And even if he has, who's going to spank him? Are you going to spank God? He's got no parent. God doesn't have a mama or a daddy. God is it. He is the top of all top bananas. He has never had anybody looking down on him, correcting him, him because he never does anything wrong. He has no wrongdoing to hide. He has no repercussions to avoid. He's automatically always right, so he does no need to lie. He can't lie. He can't do anything wrong. He has no ego that needs to be inflated. He has no insecurities that needs to be stroked and needs to be puffed up. Because he already automatically sits on the highest pedestal on the biggest stage of the universe. God never fails. If he makes a promise, he will keep his promise. He has always kept his promise. He has no reason to lie. In fact, he cannot because it is impossible for him not to keep his promise. God cannot lie. Whew, what a blessing. Last one that I'm done. God cannot deny himself. In other words, God cannot cease to be God. God cannot shed the skin of the divine and put on some other skin, some other sinful skin, for example. He just is always and will ever be God. From henceforth and everlasting, He is God. There is no was with God. There is no will be with God. There just is God. I am that I am. He cannot deny Himself. Listen to what Paul says. 2 Timothy uh, 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, now in that context, that means here's the option to suffer. I'll choose not to suffer for Christ. So I'll deny Christ, so I won't have to suffer. Short-term gratification, long-term punishment. If we deny him, he will deny us. I believe the master says the same thing, does he not? If you confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. Paul says the same thing. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. Children of a king. If we deny him, what children are we? We're, we're kicking ourselves out of the house. We don't get to reign with him. He will deny us. These aren't mine. I don't know them. Depart from me. If we, my Bible says this, if we believe not, yet he abides faithful. Let's put it this way. Though we sometimes let him down, he's never let us down. Though we sometimes are faithless, he will ever be faithful. And then Paul says, he cannot deny himself. He cannot stop being what he is. And what he is is a being that will never let you down. What about me, though? 
What about you? God cannot deny himself, but you must deny yourself. See, you once started out pure, holy, sinless, made pure, holy, sinless. And then what happened? You grew up, and you were tempted with evil, and you lied, and all kinds of other sins you committed. You fell away from God. You stopped looking like God, you started looking like the devil, a pattern that has been there from the beginning. When the devil told Adam and Eve, you eat that, you'll be like God. No, actually we ate it, now we're like you. From the beginning, that's been the lie. If you sin, it'll be great, and then when you sin, it's terrible. Forevermore, unless you change it. How do you change it? I'm living this life of sin. Sin has now stained my life. What do I need to do? I need to start a new life. I need to have a new birth. I need a new beginning, and Jesus says, I've got one for you. Great, give me a new life. Here's what you got to do. Luke 9, 23. Follow me. Okay, I'll follow you. Wait. If you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. He cannot deny himself because he's perfect and holy and he has no reason ever to be anything but. But I am now imperfect and unholy. I need to shed this skin of sin. I need to take on a new mantle, become a new person, have a new birth, I must deny myself, take up my cross, my instrument of death, and follow him up Golgotha's hill to my point of death, and be washed in the blood which he shed on his hill for me. So then through that new birth, I start over, sinless, pure, holy, denying myself, putting on him. If you are here this morning, you're not a Christian, God offers you something amazing. He offers you a chance to start over, to shed the skin of sin, to become new again. Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? I don't know, and I don't care, but I tell you this, he made a book he can't break. Filled with promises he must keep. And when I read this book, it tells me all that I've done wrong against him and against his holiness, and it tells me all that he's offered me to undo that wrong. And if that's your condition this morning and you want to undo that wrong, then the opportunity is yours to obey the gospel. To become a child of God, to start over with Jesus Christ. Do that by believing him, trusting him. He'll never let you down. Trust him. Repent to him. Confess your faith in him. Then be baptized into him. His blood will wash your sins. And then you can live faithfully for him and receive your heavenly goal someday. Can we help you this morning? If we can, let us know how right now. Please come as we stand and sing.